now. And I pray over our hearts as we receive them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, good morning and welcome. Uh, glad you guys are here. We are in week five of our series, Don't Tread on Thee. It's been, uh, for me anyway, and through some conversations I've heard as well, just a really powerful, impactful, and challenging series, to say the least. And uh, we've been just journeying through the book of Jude. We've been looking at Peter, 2 Peter, 1 Peter, and all the things that correlate to what we've been talking about and what Jude calls us to in his letter, to really what we've been saying is contend for the faith and to beware of the scoffers. You know, each week um, as I finished up one sermon, I've felt God leading me from that one to the next one. And it did not fall in line with what I had planned for the series, but it is God's plan, and it's always better than mine. Amen? <laughs> um, and so last week, we, we talked, I kind of ended, and I was talking about temptation and the temptation of the flesh and how we uh, tend to seek out satisfaction versus living in the fruits of the Spirit, which will bring us sanctification. We talked a lot about that. And uh, the Lord let, led me to uh, really dive a little bit more into our temptation and our, 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 our need um, for sanctification. But there's this, this, this correlation that he brought to my attention between the trauma that we've experienced in the past and the temptation that we deal with today. And so I'm going to put it like this, and I'll continue to say it this way the rest of the time. Yesterday's trauma triggers today's temptation. Yesterday's trauma triggers today's temptation. You know, and through studying the, the books of Jude and, and Peter and even throughout different letters from other apostles, uh, oftentimes you will, you will see the authors, like Jude, reminding Israel and Gentiles and even us, the reader, of Israel's past. You know, often returning to one, one of the uh, probably most, like, look-to stories, the, the Exodus, Right? And, 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 and there's this, this slavery in Egypt, and there's the, the Passover, and then there, God, you know, God rescued them out of Egypt, and then he's leading them through the, the wilderness, and he's providing for them, and then there's disbelief, and they wander in the wilderness, and there's disobedience, and, and they enter the promised land. They have to fight to stay in the promised land, to overcome the promised land, and, and, and settle there, and you know, as they enter into the promised land, and you'll, you'll find this all throughout the letters, God continually says to them, make sure that you are not following the ways of culture. Make sure that you are not worshiping the way that they worship. And he gives them very specific instructions, but ultimately they don't follow his instructions. And they end up losing the promised land. They find themselves defeated. They find themselves in exile. And you can read on and on and on and on and on all about Israel's history. But, you know, for me, I, I, I see that in Jude's letter, and I see it in Peter's letter, and I see it in Paul as he writes to different churches, and I, I, I come to this question, you know, why would these men of faith that are desiring to point people to Jesus bring up the trauma of yesterday, the, the trauma of their past? And I think many times they, they bring it up to remind them of the dangers of repeating it, and then other times, they're bringing it up to call them out, the Israelites and the, the believers, uh, of the fact that they are guilty of already repeating it. You know, I, as I look at the, the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, and this is where Jude is pointing back to as we read through his letter, um, I, I see the, 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 to, the Torah as a story of the Israelites' trauma. Now, at the same time, I see it as a story of God's triumph over their trauma. And, and that's what we see time and time again. And so it's not just a reminder of the trauma, it's a reminder of a God who can triumph over their trauma and also ours. But as you, you go back through this story, it doesn't take long, like as you're reading through it and you kind of read and you're like, well, you know, why would these people uh, who have been rescued by God, who have been provided by God, why would they... Go, want to go back to, to the slavery that they were once in. And it's almost as if they, they begin to suppress or maybe forget 
the trauma that they experienced or forget the fact that God rescued them from it. And so because they, they lived in these traumatic circumstances for an extended period of time, right? Because maybe they're trying to forget everything, right? And they went through so much. There was slavery, there was infanticide, there was wilderness wandering, there was war, there was defeat, there was exile. And, and so they go through all of these things and we, we see them act or react based off of their trauma, manifesting in what I'm calling trauma-based triggers that ultimately lead them into temptation that results in sin. Now, in Jude and Peter, they both bring up the rebellion of Korah. Now, I mentioned that a few weeks ago. I was talking about the dreamers and the defilers. I encourage you all to go check out that story because I felt it was really cool um, because the ground opened up and swallows like a couple hundred people. And so, you know, not great for them, okay? I'm like, this is awesome. This is in the Bible. And so you can definitely check that story out in number 16. But this is, this is what happens. The Israelites, they're rescued from Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. They're on their way to the promised land. They get to the promised land. And, you know, this whole time, the Israelites are just grumbling and complaining and just they're, they're whining about things and they're, they're wishing to go back to Egypt and they're like, man, the food was better there and we didn't have to wander around and we had, you know, just we had the security and safety, even though we were in slavery. And so there's discontented grumbling all over the place. And then Korah incites a rebellion, considers himself and many others on the same level as Moses, right, questioning the authority of God. And then questions whether or not God is even going to provide for them or lead them to safety. And then, of course, 200 plus people get swallowed up. The earth opens up and they, they ultimately perish and die. Now, two chapters prior to this, Numbers 14. Let me, let me read what, kind of what they were saying. Verse 1, and we're going to go all the way through verse 4 and we're going to kind of focus on 3 and 4. Uh, then the whole community broke into loud cries and the people wept that night. All the Israelites complained about Moses and Arian, and the whole, whole community told them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us up into this land to die by the sword? Our wives and children will become plunder. Wouldn't it be better, here it is, for us to go back to Egypt? Wouldn't it be better for us to go back into slavery? Wouldn't us, it be better to go back to that life that we once lived. And so they said to one another, let's appoint a leader and go back to Egypt. Two chapters later, enter Korah, who thinks he's gonna be the leader that's gonna lead them back into slavery, and that does not happen. And so within this, and, and really to get the context, you, you have to read through the story to understand what I'm saying. I can only give you so much, but Korah and the Israelites responded and reacted based off the trauma that they had already experienced. You see, what Korah had experienced in Egypt, um, it was trauma. Now, of course, we, we also see a tone of pride in Korah, but I'm not going to focus on that. I want to focus on the trauma today. So what was Korah's trauma that he experienced, uh, or even really what the Israelites experienced? And so here's some trauma that they were going through. Uh, first, it was generational slavery. They were in Egypt for 300 plus years. And so what this means is that Korah was a slave to the Egyptians. His father was a slave to the Egyptians. His grandfather was a slave to the Egyptians and maybe his children as well. And it was, it was harsh slave labor. And so there's that trauma of, you know, being under the control or under the thumb of somebody else and not being treated kindly. And then you know, throughout the midst of this, of course, you got to realize that there is a suppression of their moral and religious beliefs. Um, and we, I think we see this play out. I mean, just anytime you are kind of um, entered into another culture and you're just a part of that culture, a small part, you, you begin to take on or begin to live out that culture and what they believe. And they begin to force it upon you. Again, if you're, if you're a slave to the Egyptians, they're going to force these things on you, and they're going to suppress what you want to do and how you want to live and what you believe uh, in Christ. And so they are being suppressed in their own beliefs, and so they're, they're struggling with that, and they have that trauma. Then, of course, there's the the homelessness and feeling unwelcome. There's a real fancy word for this. They were sojourners in this land. It's just a fun word that says they're just passing through. This isn't their land. So there's this homelessness, but not just that it's not their land, 
they're not welcome in this land. They're not wanted in this land. And that leads to the next one, which is the infanticide, where uh, the, the Pharaoh of the time began to murder the Israelite baby boys. And the, the plan was not to just kill the boys, but to wipe out all the men so that then they could erase the line of the Israelites. And so that the Egyptian men could sleep with the Israelite women and then begin to just erase all of God's people. And it's, it's just a plan of the enemy. And so, for, you know, think about this in Korah's life. You know, maybe he experienced this by watching one of his sons be murdered. Or, or maybe he was younger and he watched his younger brother be taken and be murdered. It, or maybe it was a grandson. I, I don't know the age of Korah and I didn't look that up, but just think about the trauma of having a, a, a child a loved one, a family member taken from you and put to death. So there's that. Trauma, 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 trauma. And then, of course, there's the plagues. Now, here's why I said the plagues were traumatic experience. We look at that and go, man, these are awesome miracles of God. Absolutely wonderful. Could you imagine witnessing that? I mean, really think about it. Think about watching all of that take place. From, you know, the blood and uh, the gnats and the livestock. Here's the, here's the interesting one, ready? Imagine being told by Moses, hey, listen, if you don't want your firstborn to die, you need to put blood on your, on your doorpost so that the, the angel of death doesn't come in and kill him. And so it's, it's, they're, they're miracles, yes. But I could imagine witnessing God's power in that moment was uh, just somewhat traumatic and wondering, man, if he did that to, you know what I'm saying? Like you begin to just think about God's power. Now, of course, you have all this trauma. And I, I think kind of overarching all of it is this sense of abandonment. God has abandoned us. God has forsaken us. God who, who promised Abraham to lead him into a land and that he would be the father of a nation has led us to this land to kill us. And so you, you just, you have all this, this trauma, internal, external, uh, you know, solve, like all this trauma is taking place. And this is how you begin to see the Israelites, including Korah, react and respond because they experienced this trauma. They're saying, this is what we experienced before. And we may experience it again. Now, we know the story. God shows up. He hears their cry. He saves them. But that doesn't mean that the trauma they experienced goes away. And that means that the trauma in their past triggers the temptation in their present, causing feelings that, well, God is just going to abandon us again. And you can go through and you can read it. They say, God has led us into the wilderness to kill us. God has led us into the hands of our enemy to kill us. It was better in Egypt. At least we could have stayed there, yes, under slavery and all this other stuff, but at least we could have lived our lives. And so God is going to abandon us again. God is not going to provide for us again. God is not going to save us again. And so they are tempted to take matters into their own hands based off of the trauma that they've already experienced. So I, you know, I read this story and I, I, I constantly wonder this. Why, why was Israel tempted so often to return to slavery in Egypt and ultimately return to the trauma that they had already experienced in their lives? They're desiring to return to the very place that caused their trauma in an effort to keep the trauma from happening again. Do you understand? And we, we, we do this. Like, think about it. Shift the focus to our lives. We do the same thing. We are tempted to return to the slavery of sin after we've been rescued from it. And, and it's wild. It's the very thing that caused trauma in our life. But we feel this pull to say there's something there and it, it feels comfortable. And I, I, I know how that 
took place, and I know what I experienced there. I don't know what the future holds, and I don't know how this is going to happen. So I can go back to that sin and that slavery, and I can be comfortable in it. And it causes us to make decisions based off of our trauma and past temptations. I mean, think about it. How often, how often do we succumb to the temptation based off the trauma that we experienced in the past? It's a really powerful question to ask. Let me, let me do this. I, I think we, we all need to get on the same page here. By show of hands, how many of you would say that you have experienced trauma in your life? If your hand's not up, you need to raise it. And here's why I say that. Every single one of us has experienced trauma. And I, and I think sometimes we think, well, I didn't experience trauma on this like crazy level, right? Where, you know, someone was murdered in front. I didn't have that kind of trauma. Like we go to these big things and we think, well, that's what trauma is. I wasn't ripped away from my family when I was younger. You know, we, we think about that trauma. But trauma manifests itself in everyday life. And, and really, and this is, I'm going I'm to get into this, but what it does is it begins to wire or rewire our thought process, our thinking process, and how we act and make decisions going forward. And if we don't know about the trauma that we've experienced, we will continue to fall victim to the temptation that happens to us today and in the future. And so it's so important for us to understand that we have trauma. And that's where, like, God brought this to my attention, and I feel like that's what he wanted me to bring to light today, uh, that's, that the temptations that we experience today is the result of the trauma that we experienced in the, in the past. Yesterday's trauma triggers today's temptation. Now, let me just out the gate tell you this. I'm no expert on trauma. I don't claim to be an expert on trauma, but I will tell you I've had experience due to the various roles that I've had in my life. Of course, I've experienced my own personal trauma, and I'll, I'll share that in a minute. As a pastor and studying God's word, I see the trauma all throughout God's people's history, but I also see it within the church and within God's people today. And then as a foster parent, I've seen trauma on a whole new level. And I've been exposed to trauma that I never knew existed. And I got, you know, just countless hours of training in trauma and what it does and how I need to, as a parent and a foster parent, respond to these children who are reacting or acting based off of trauma. Things that they experienced that they didn't know how to process then and they still haven't figured out how to process now. And so let me, let me quickly, quickly share, but it, here's... It, here's what, I, what I've come to, and this is why I want to share about trauma today, and I feel that God has called me to, because in my study of God's word, in counseling others, in my trauma-informed training, I've come to realize that the root of many of our decisions today is triggered by the trauma of our past. And for many of us, we don't even realize it. And so we, what we do is we focus on how we were tempted, we focus on the sin that we committed, but we fail to go back to the root of, of both of those things, which is the trauma that happened to us. And maybe it was a decision that, that we made, or maybe it was something that was done to us that now affects the decisions that we make today. My trauma, here we go. Uh, I'm gonna give you the shortened version of it. In fourth grade, I witnessed my father committing adultery. Now, as a 10-year-old, I don't think I fully comprehended what was going on, but I remember it. Didn't know how to process it. Didn't know what to think about it. Guess what that created in my mind? Sexual trauma, relational trauma, marital trauma. From that moment, my father was imprisoned and shortly after we moved, I was in the fifth grade. Now I have abandonment trauma. I have father trauma and the trauma of transitioning. And if you were a child who ever had to move in, in those ages, between the ages of 10 or 12, this, this time when you're already experiencing so much change in your life, 
and then you, you know, all your friends are pulled, everything you know from you is pulled, that's, that's trauma. And it, and it affects the way we, we, we act and the way we react to, to things moving forward. A few years go by, my dad's back in the picture. And by his words, by his actions, by his lack of encouragement in my life, I, I could tell that he was, sorry, it felt to me that he was very disappointed in my personality and the, and the things that I got passionate about. And so now I, I have identity trauma and acceptance trauma. Fast forward to my senior year. My parents get a divorce due to infidelity. Again, another extremely transitional time in my life. I'm getting ready to graduate high school, and in the midst of it, I'm told that my parents are being separated. So now all the trauma that I experienced back when I was 10 resurfaces, and so I have the same thing. There's marital and relational trauma, there's abandonment trauma, and an added layer of Father trauma. And I, you know, maybe you hear that and you say, well, that, you know, I, I, I get that, I understand that. And do you want to know what I did? And I was talking to my mom about this, and I was really good about this, is I, I just pressed it all down. I kept it all inside. And I thought, if I don't ever deal with it, it won't ever affect me. But it was actually the exact opposite. It took me over. 10 years to finally forgive my father. And it wasn't until that moment that I began to be free from the trauma that was created. I had to get there. And I, I can't, I don't have time to share how I've processed all that or worked through all of that because, I mean, that's like 15, 20 years of processing, right? Right? And I, I think still today there are things that I do, there are th ways that I act that comes from the trauma that I experienced when I was younger. But I will, I will tell you this. The trauma that my father caused to me could have easily led me down a dark and destructive path. Why do I know that? Because I've counseled students who have gone through it and adults who have gone through it. And so by the grace of God, in sixth grade, I found a father that brought me healing and hope and triumph over my trauma, and that was my heavenly father. Amen. And I'm so thankful that I did in the sixth grade. And, and, and because of that, from that time, even though I continued to experience those things, I continued to be directed, guided, and provided by God, by the Holy Spirit. He continued to sanctify me from this world, from temptations and sin, and from the trauma um, that it brings. And so, I mean, I, so I, I'll say this. If, if I want to say, how, how did I process it? It's because I went to him, and I had him, and I relied on him, and I continued to go to him daily. Because I couldn't on my own. I couldn't overcome it on my own. I couldn't get past it on my own. I needed him to sanctify me. Now, maybe you can relate to one or more of the trauma-related issues that I've experienced. Maybe today as I'm bringing it up, you know, it's, it's being brought to the forefront for you. And maybe you've been repressing them and you're like, well, geez, pastor, thanks. I've tried to forget about that. Well, at the end of the day, you pushing those things down and never dealing with them are never going to help you. I don't, you. Maybe you need to seek forgiveness. Maybe you need to seek guidance. But you need to work towards getting past the trauma because it is affecting your decisions today. It is affecting your relationships today. It is affecting who you are today, whether you believe it or think it or feel it or not. And so you've got to get back to the root. Now, maybe one of those things wasn't trauma that you dealt with. So let me, let me share a few other just various uh, trauma triggers is what I'll call them. I, I talked through the first one, my father figure trauma. And sadly, there are many men like me who grew up with that trauma from their father. And I believe even more so today in the culture that we live in. 
where, man, where the father, the men, they're not leading their home, they're not leading their spouse, they're not leading their children, they're not following God. All they're doing is following their own fleshly satisfaction in the, in the wake they're leaving traumatic experiences for their children, for their spouse, and for their extended family. This is something that affects us all. So there's father figure trauma. And you know this could come from your father or a father figure or a male role model in your life. And maybe it happens for a lack of trust, lack of security, a lack of encouragement, um, causing letdown emotionally, physically, spiritually. And I, I think this trauma can even manifest itself in how your father treats his wife and your other siblings. And we see it and we don't know what to do about it or how to respond to it, how to react to it. And so we have that. Then there's the insecurity trauma trigger. I talked a little bit about this one, but never feeling like what we do is good enough. Starts with our parents. Then it goes into you know, other relationships, maybe a romantic relationship, but it could just be with a friend. It could also be in the workplace. And we, we just never get the encouragement that we need or something happened when we are younger and we need even more, but it's never given to us. And so every relationship from that moment we go into with this insecurity and we try to protect ourselves and put walls up and it ends up leading to more trauma. Then there's the religious trauma trigger. This one's often deemed as church hurt. It's a word that's thrown around a lot and it's very broad and it can mean a lot of different things for sure. But maybe for you it was growing up and your parents took you or forced you to go to church and you didn't like it. And maybe it was a church that seemed like it was all law and no love. Or maybe it was the exact opposite and it was all grace and no truth. And it led to you to experiencing people who were two-faced, right? Hypocrites. They would act one way at church on Sunday. And this could have even been your parents. And then in other circles with other friends out in public or even in private, they were a totally different person. And they didn't uphold any of the things that you heard the pastor talking about or you heard them talking about or saying they were doing that was all a lie. And so you have church hurt from an early age. And there are countless young adults who have left the church today because their parents said they were Christian, but they never lived like it. Church hurt. It can, of course, come from the moral failures of a pastor. We've seen that time and time again. And that, that creates trauma for entire congregations and people leaving the church altogether. Then there's abuse trauma triggers. I don't need to say much about this one, but I will say this is physical, it's verbal, and even emotional abuse. And it causes intimacy, intimacy issues. It, it causes us to shut down from forming deep, healthy relationships. Um, and it carries extreme issues into our marriages. If we were abused in some way by the opposite sex, then we were very guarded even when we enter into marriage because it's caused these, these, this trauma in our lives. And so we, we push again against it. Um, then there's sexual trauma triggers. Now this, of course, could be unintentional. It's typically unpleasant. Or it could be an accidental sexual experience. Now, of course, there's sexual abuse. That can, can take on many facets and happen in many different ways. So that's one. But pornography is a sexual trauma trigger. Sexual activity in multiple relationships outside the bounds of marriage causes sexual trauma triggers. And those go into you know, a lot of different things, insecurity, not feeling good enough, and having to think that you have to do something in order to be liked by someone else, and then you carry that into your marriage. And I think the other thing with pornography, what it does is it gives this unrealistic expectation from one partner to the other, and it can never be met. Sexual trauma triggers. It, it, what pornography does is it causes disgusting, warped, unrealistic expectations of sexual experiences. 
And you go into marriage thinking that what you've been watching for all these years is what you're going to get, and then you don't. And then you turn to more pornography, or worse, you turn to adultery and find it somewhere else. The last one I'll say is unfaithful partner trauma triggers. And this could be a relationship when you were younger. It could be a relationship that was headed towards marriage but never got there. It could even be within your marriage. They were unfaithful to you. And they hurt you. And that put up walls. And now you, you push against relationships of that type. And maybe you begin to seek out intimacy through other facets. And so there, there are so many more. And I, I, I want us to understand that and see that those, that thing that you went through, the thing that was done to you, like it is affecting you today and you can't ignore it. You can't just think, oh, it's going to go away. You have to talk about it. You have to deal with it. And ultimately, you have to surrender it to your heavenly father to help begin the healing process inside of you. And here's why. Because typically what happens is as we uh, have that trauma and never deal with that trauma, we begin to project our trauma onto other people. As parents, we do it to our kids. As a husband, as a wife, we, we do it to our, our spouse. We do it to our friends. We do it to our coworkers. We project it onto our pastor. We project it onto other church members. And so we got to make sure that we, we see it, we know it. I mean, just think about your traumatic experiences and how they have negatively affected your decisions, your actions, and your relationships. Again, we go back to that question, why did Israel want to return to slavery in Egypt? And why are we tempted to return to slavery in sin? It's because of the trauma that we've already experienced it. It was interesting, we were in a group yesterday and at the end of group, I kind of just brought up this and I was just seeking out prayer from the guys. And um, as we were talking, it, it brought a verse to mind in Romans 7. And I've shared this before, but I, I read it in a new light as I thought about my, my trauma, my temptation, and how I act or react to certain situations. Let me read it to you. Romans seven fifteen. It just says, For I do not understand what I'm doing, because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. And what I get from that is oftentimes in an effort to attempt to avoid the trauma again, we are tempted to take matters into our own hands and we sin and we create even more trauma. And we're left going, why did I make that decision? Why did I do that that way? Why did I say that like that? And it's almost like, we, like something came over us and we didn't even fully understand what we were doing or why we were doing it or why we were saying it because the trauma that we experienced in the past it had control of us in the temptations that we step into today. That's how trauma makes us feel. Sometimes without us even knowing it, it has rewired our thinking and our reaction in certain circumstances. And I've been talking about how there's trauma triggers, and this is something that I learned as a foster parent. There are specific things that as a dad, as a father, as a man, that I could say, that I could do. There could be a place that I take one of my children, and it will trigger them, and it'll send them into a spiral because they are going back, and they are taking the trauma that they experienced in the past, and now they're attaching it to me and saying, he's going to do the same thing that my last father did. And they begin to act out and they begin to push away. And, I, you know, it's, it's so hard to witness and see because you go, that, I don't know who that child is. I've never seen this before. And because of my training, I can say right now they're, they are triggered and I got to embrace them and I got to love them. Even though they are taking their trauma and they're projecting it on me, I'm going to show them love and grace in this moment. And I, I 
that just correlates into how we handle things and how we do things. And I think so many of us, without even realizing it, we've been living out of our trauma, reacting to relationships, to circumstances, to our spouse, to children in the workplace based off past trauma, and it leads to more sin, which in turn leads to more trauma for yourself and for others. And the circle goes round and round because we aren't willing to talk about it. We aren't willing to deal with it. We don't want to bring it up, or maybe we just don't want to admit to it. It might be too painful. Maybe our pride gets in the way. But the truth of the matter is, when we succumb to temptation, we cause trauma again to ourselves and also to others. And if there's one thing I know about trauma, it sticks around. The longer it happens, the longer it sticks around. The longer it happens, the longer it takes to move past it. And so trauma causes us to act or react based off of fear, anxiety, insecurity, and oftentimes avoidance of conflict. Attempting to avoid, really what we're trying to do is we're attempting to avoid experiencing trauma again. And in doing so, we try to take matters into our own hands and we just make it worse. Again, we, we project it. And we think, you know, if we do this this way, this won't happen. And it, it, makes, it just makes a mess of things. But if you look at that, if you look at fear, if you look at anxiety, if you look at insecurity, none of those things is how God wants us to operate. He doesn't want us to live in that. He wants us to live free of that. He doesn't want us living in our trauma, but he wants us to experience tri triumph over that. Now, how do we do that? Well, we, we talked a little bit about this last week. In Philippians 2, what did it say? It, it said we got to work out our salvation with, with fear and trembling. And this is what Jude's been talking about. We contend for our faith. We, we bring sanctification to our trauma by what? By surrendering it to God and relying on the Holy Spirit to help us work through it to bring triumph to it. Throughout Israel's history, you know, we, when we see them wandering in the wilderness and being defeated, being destroyed, taken into exile, all of that was a result of not living for God, but instead succumbing to the culture around them. And so here's what I'll say. Trauma is the result of not living for God, but succumbing to cultural temptations. Let me say it another way. Trauma is the result of choosing worldly satisfaction over holy sanctification. And that's, that's really it. Like we have got to begin to take this thing and say, I don't, I don't want to live here anymore. I don't want to be in this anymore. I don't want to experience this anymore. I am going to daily hand it to God. I'm going to recognize it. I'm going to call it out. I'm going to call it what it is. I'm going to own up for the decisions and the actions that I've made because of it. And I'm going to say, God, I need you to sanctify me from the trauma that I've, I've experienced and caused on other people. You know, it's interesting. You, you get into the New Testament and you get into the Gospels and Jesus shows up and you find that these religious leaders, they were so ultra focused on following the law. Right? Like to a fault. It was all law, 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 law. You want to know why they were so focused on following the law? Go back to their history. Oftentimes they found themselves in predicaments because they didn't abide to God's law. Right? They found themselves defeated in exile. And so now they're like, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We're just going all in with this law thing. Like we're going to be ultra focused on law. And what happened in that is they, they went too far and they removed love from law. And it ended up taking them in another direction entirely. And that temptation to avoid the trauma led them to even more trauma. And so in this moment, what does God do? God sent Jesus to heal their past trauma by offering them love, but continuing to call them to abide in his law. It's not that love got rid of the law, but Jesus came in and said, you need the love of God and the, the law of God. You need the grace of God and you need the truth of God. You need the justification from God and you need the sanctification from God. And that's what he did. And so, he, so we, we overcompensate based off of our trauma and we end up causing more problems. 
And, and Jesus says, listen, if you come to me, I will be your center. I will give you the Holy Spirit, and I will allow you to live both in the law and in the love, to have that in your life and to share that with others. But you've got to bring it to me. I love what Jude 24 says. This is the amplified version. It says, Jesus is able to keep you from stumbling or falling into sin and to present you unblemished, blameless, fruitless in the presence of his glory with triumphant joy and unspeakable delight. And so what's this saying? That we, God doesn't want us to live in, in trauma And and the hurt and the pain and the regret that comes from that, he wants us to live in triumphant joy and unspeakable delight. And so I'm saying, Jesus came in, he fulfilled the law with love, he fulfilled the grace with truth. Jesus saves you from your trauma and he calls us to sanctification to keep us from experiencing trauma again. And not only that, he calls us to sanctification so that we won't cause trauma on other people. And And this is why sanctification is so important for us. And so here's the truth. If you want to turn your trauma into triumph, you have to hand it over to Jesus. You wanna know why? Because he is triumphant over the enemy. He is triumphant over sin. He is triumphant over death. And so all of that, all of his triumph was done on our behalf so that you and I can live triumphantly and not traumatically because Jesus, he can turn our trauma into our triumph. And he wants to do that for you. And he can do that for you. But there's an awareness of it. And then you gotta surrender it. I'm gonna ask that you stand to your feet. Bow your heads, close your eyes. And I think I just want to do two things today. I I sense that someone today, or many today, have just been living in the shadow of their trauma for far too long. It's held them back. It's held them from the life that God has called them to and desires for them. It's, it's held them back from experiencing his love and the love of his people and, and the joy and the delight that Jesus offers us. I don't know what you went through, but having experienced trauma myself, I, I know it was hard. But as hard as that was, And Jesus can bring victory to it. And so here's what I'll say. If that's you today, and in your relationships and in your decisions, you tend to operate on fear and worry and anxiety and control, all based of your trauma and you're tired and you're weary and you're burdened and you just don't see an end in sight. Can I encourage you today, right now, surrender it. You don't have to carry that. Jesus took that. Why would you carry it around with you? Right now, right where you're at. Say, God, I, sur- I surrender it. Say, God, I, I forgive those who, who did that to me and hurt me in that way. I know if I continue to live in bitterness and resentment, I will never move past it because in forgiveness there is freedom. And so just as Christ forgave us of our trespasses against him, today, if you want to surrender the trauma from the past, you have got to offer forgiveness. Move past it. And then today or tomorrow or the next week, as those feelings come up again, you surrender it. And you replace it. What do we replace it with? With the Holy Spirit, right? With love and joy and kindness and patience and gentleness and goodness and self-control. We replace it with the word of truth where we never found encouragement before from somebody else. We can find it in God's word. 
where, where we never felt like we were good enough. We are good enough to God. He sent his son to die on the cross for us. Man, like, honestly, if we have father issues, we have a heavenly father who is perfect, who is kind, who is loving, who is merciful, who will provide, who will help you and guide you and direct you through his Holy Spirit. My freedom from my father trauma came when I surrendered it to my heavenly father who took it. And I am grateful for that day. There was freedom in that day. Surrender that. Now I think on the other side, and I, I, I know this is where we're at right now because I've done it myself. We, we look at it and we go, man, I have really been projecting my trauma on my kids and on my wife. And I, I think for us, we, like if, if God is saying right now and the, the spirit is convicting you right now, what he's saying to you is you need to go ask for forgiveness and just tell him you're sorry. It's amazing how much that word can lift the weight and burden of trauma. When we push our pride aside, we recognize our own faults and the trauma that we've caused, and we simply say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for how I treated you. I'm sorry for how I reacted. I'm sorry for what I said. I'm sorry for what I did. There can be freedom, and there can be healing. And then you begin to showcase what healthy relationships look like. Not what we bury and suppress and ignore or avoid all in a, a matter of not having conflict, but we come out and we get raw and we get real and we cry and we forgive and we apologize and our kids need to see that. God, you're so good. Today, I just want to thank you, God, for your word, <laughs> for allowing it to pierce our heart and our mind, for allowing it to release the grip that the enemy has had and held over us for so long. I just thank you for that. Yes, there's hurt. Yes, there's pain. Yes, there's shame. Yes, there's regret. But as we take all those things and they come to the surface, we place them at your feet. And you take them. And you forgive them. And you turn them into joy. And you turn them into delight. And you turn them into peace. And you turn them into hope. And that's how we get to walk out of here today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for speaking. Thank you for moving. Thank you for lifting the weight and the burden today. I pray that it wouldn't just be something that we say, I had this moment today with God, but I pray that it's something that we say, I have these moments every day with God, where I choose triumph over trauma, where I choose victory over loss, where I choose the future over the past, where I choose Jesus, Jesus over my sin, and over my temptation and over anything that this world has to offer. Thank you for your son. Thank you for what he did. Thank you for how he redeemed us. Thank you for how he justified us. Thank you for how he calls us and sanctifies us. May we be ever more like him all the days of our life. It's in his name that I pray.